Hi, and welcome back to my continuing look at my own personal Ballet Arcade Astrocade console collection. This is part 15, and I'm going to be diving into the Bob Fabris collection again. This is box one, as it has been for the last nine episodes, and part 10 of that. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy the video. It's made up of me diving into five folders. Those folders are Anderson uh, et al. Archive Storage, which talks about archiving tapes. Another one is the Astro Management folder from March 30th, 1981, which is a management meeting uh, with Astrovision Inc. that Bob Fabris attended. And I think there's even a recording of that. Uh, an inquiries folder, uh, letters and orders folders, and finally a folder that has, uh, which is an which is untitled and it's got uh, newsletters, flyers, and a dealer kit. And we're gonna wrap it up with really the last folder, which is very thick and contains uh, miscellaneous uh, documents. And I will try to make that into probably two or three separate folders. Enjoy the video and come back for part 16, which should come out in a week or so. Hi, welcome back to a uh, look at my personal Ballet Arcade, Astrocade collection. This is part 15. This is another look at my Bob Fabris collection. This is box one, still. This is uh, part 10 of looking at that box. And today I'm gonna quickly cover what I covered, uh, the five folders that I covered in the last episode. And I'm going to show five new folders and then I'm going to um, show a hint of what's coming up next. And I hope you look forward to this one. I've been looking forward to uh, getting started on these. I plan to go out of town, but I won't be going out of town now, so. Uh, we'll see. I have some other things I can do while I'm uh, here to make up for that time. So I might not be making videos anyway, but in the meantime, I will make a video for today. Let's see what's going on. In my last video, I kind of was going a little bit hoarse from talking so much, and my wife mentioned to me, she said, you know, Adam, uh, you, you don't sound anything like you do in your videos, and that's because you mostly are whispering. And I fixed that in post, but it doesn't work great. Um, but let's see if I can't talk a little louder without losing my voice. Here goes. Last time I covered a folder called Letters and Programs, um, one called the Indexes for the Ballet Arcade, uh, and also Balcheck, a uh, folder called Unsorted that had letters, uh, tutorials, and more, uh, one that just had uh, some information on a cut and paste flyer that was handed out by Bob Fabris, and some schematics for an arcade game called Extra Bases. And here's what I will be covering in this episode. In this episode, I will be covering five boxes. One is called Anderson et al. Archival Storage, and that's going to be talking about uh, tape storage. Astrocade Management uh, from March 20th, 1981. Uh, inquiries, which are letters, I think. Um, letters and orders. And finally, one that um, is unlabeled, but has some newsletters and a dealer uh, kit, uh, which had a poster, and I was gonna to try to dig it out of my garage, but I cannot find it. So I'm going to try to find a picture I took of it, which is a low res picture, but it's uh, it's of the whole poster. But I never could scan the whole poster because it's so large. I mean, it's a poster. I have a flatbed scanner, which can scan something, I think about 11 by 14 inches, and that's many feet by many feet wide. So I can't scan that. But let's get started with Anderson et al. This folder is called Archive Storage, Anderson et al. And it's also called, uh, with my own hand labeling, Box 1, Folder 49. And my folder listings don't exactly match how many folders have been covered so far. They have to do more with the way I was scanning at the time and I was keeping track of how that was done. So you can ignore those numbers for the most part, but for me they're helpful to say out loud because they do mean something to me internally. So in um, August, uh, early August of 1980, a uh, few people um, talked about something that came up in a previous uh, newsletter from the Arcadian, uh, which was um, volume two, number nine, which I guess was July or early August of 1980. And it was about someone who was having trouble with archiving software. And the first letter Bob got back was from um, Craig Anderson. And Craig Anderson wrote on August 5th, 1980, he says, um, I am enjoying the attached article on archive storage excuse me, I am enclosing the attached article on archive storage and basic maintenance as a cure-all for most of the problems related to the loss after a period of time, page 84 of the last issue. And he goes on to say uh, what he thinks it might be, 
uh, and then uh, that he's looking forward to getting a blue ram. And he actually wrote a three-page article, which I don't think the entire thing was printed, but if you're interested in it all, you can actually download the three pages and uh, read it. But what he says in summary is that um, he thinks that the problems have more to do with um, maybe the, the tapes that he's buying than... Um, and, well, I'm not going to get into it basically, but he says dust and dirt can be problems. And he goes into quite a bit of what uh, can solve problems. And he said long-time storage is considered 10 years. So consider in 1980, they were considering long-time storage uh, to be ending in about, um, say, 1990, which is even before I got my first Ar Ballet Arcade. Um, and now it's 2021. That was uh, 41 years ago. And so obviously, hopefully, if anyone took his advice, maybe these tapes have lasted long enough to be archived. And you'll be surprised to learn that, well, first, maybe you won't be surprised to learn that it's basically nearly impossible to get original tapes to load directly from tape using a tape recorder into a ballet nowadays unless they were newly recorded. But if you're talking about a 40-year-old tape, you'll, the tape will probably break and all that. You can usually go through once or twice and that's it. So if you do have any tapes that you want to uh, try to load back and they, and they are from your own personal collection, what I advise is you record them t uh, using a quality t cable, like a gold cable, uh, using a quality uh, recorder and uh, playback tape player and you uh, record it and then use some archiving software um, such as uh, Bally Wave, um, for what is that for 300 baud tapes and astrowave um, for uh, 2000 baud formats and you can uh, usually fix any errors and uh, if you need help with that uh, join up the uh, um, astrocade forum on groups.io and you will find that there are plenty of people including myself who can walk you through that process but um, on the very same day as w that letter was written or maybe it was the next day let's see this letter was written on August 5th so the very next day Someone named Jeffrey Cochran wrote in, and I'm going to read some more of this letter because I think it's quite interesting because it also talks about the same, everything in here talks about the same issue. And he says on August 6th, and he's writing from Saratoga Springs, New York, he says, um, I would like to offer a couple of suggestions concerning the problems of tape dropout, which were mentioned in the last, in the most recent issue of the Arcadian. Let's see, he goes on to say, first, the problem may be due to uh, problem storage of storing the tapes, but what he says in his solution is that um, the best solution for his problem is to keep him out of sunlight. Um, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm getting this one confused with uh, the next keyboard or the next here. I'm reading ahead here trying to do trying to do two, two things at once which is impossible. Record and read ahead and talk. And can I do that? Nope. Have you noticed? Um, but this guy is 22 years old and he's talking about how he got this for his own uh, game playing and then he realized he could use it for uh, computing use as well and he's been using that but he's got a very limited budget so he's happy about the ballet arcade. So there's someone not complaining about it overheating. And this person gives some in 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 interesting information. Uh, and this was also written August 6, 1980. So you can see the feedback comes back pretty quickly uh, to the Arcadian. And he says, I received and read uh, with great interest volume 2 number 9. And then he says, the, the problem of tape dropout mentioned in this issue is a problem I had also. After about six months of heavy use, my tapes suddenly started dropping out. I used an inexpensive, uh, real cheap in fact, tape recorder. I found that my problem was not the tapes by using a different, but using a different tape recorder. When I switched to a new recorder, even the worst tapes dumped perfectly. I concluded, with no technical background whatsoever, that the cheap record playback head became desensitized, he puts in quotes, to 1200-2400 hertz signal. Since that time, my new recorder has begun a similar behavior. I have now two recorders which I alternate with, music, type, and recording on the ballet. I am hopeful that uh, will solve the problem. And uh, I think probably in his case, what he's talking about is his head, his heads needed to be demagnetized, which I think might have been talked about in this archive um, article written by Craig Anderson. And finally, here is a preview of something coming up in the next issue of the Arcadian. And uh, these are notes by Bob Fabris, and this is how he sort of put his arcade uh, newsletter together, Arcadian newsletter together. And he says, record uh, tape failures, and he has some notes about what he's going to say and he basically brings up what these people talked about. So that is kind of a behind the scenes look about how one subject in the Arcadian gets covered. Let's move on to the next folder. This folder is called Astrocade Management. Um, 
March 20th, 1981. And I'm going to begin this folder bef without even talking about what's in here. Uh, I just read over this folder for about five or ten minutes to get my head around this. And this brings up a point that I've, I might have mentioned before, but I don't, I don't think so, is that I do have, I mean, I know I've mentioned that I have a podcast based on around the Astrocade, but I don't update it too often. I think there's like, there's 18 or 19 episodes so far over the last five years. So it's not, it's not really on hiatus, I just don't update, update it very often. And looking at these folders, I find plenty of material to cover. And in this one, there's almost a letter I'd read word for word on the Arcadian, um, not the Arcadian um, Astrocast, but the Astrocade Astrocast, my new um, podcast. And, and when I get to it, I'm going to talk about it. I'm, and I'm just going to ask for some feedback. Uh, I mean, really, probably the best place to ask for that feedback would be on my podcast. But since I haven't been doing my podcast lately, I can't get feedback there. So uh, let's get started here. But when I get to that letter, I'll talk about it just a bit more. So this is a flyer, and this is the, all this material in here is from before the Astrocade was re-released, but it has to do with the re-release of the Astrocade. So we have a flyer for the Ballet Professional Arcade Expandable Computer System from Astrovision. Notice something interesting. If you're familiar with the Astrocade from Astrovision, uh, there was never a white unit sold by Astrovision. Um, they, they only uh, sold it with a... Um, like the original unit, which is um, like w a wood grain finish. Uh, so this is, a, I, I don't know if they had thought they were going to make it with the white unit, but they didn't. There might have been some old stock, but this is what they use for the picture. Um, so you open this up, and this has been scanned in a high format, uh, but it's impossible to scan the whole thing, at least on my scanner, um, to show that it's this wide. So if you were to look at the, in the PDF of this, you'd see this page, and this page, and this page, and then and this page. And you sort of ruin the fact that it is laid out like this. Um, I talked about this a bit in the preview, but um, let's see what we're talking about here. And remember, this is from the 1981 re-release, or about to be re-released, um, Astrocade from uh, Astrovision. Um, or, yeah. So the Ballet Professional Arc... Whoops. The Ballet Professional Arcade Expandable Computer System. And... Did it ever really get expanded into a computer system? It depends on how you look at it. Never officially with this product, which is the ZGrass 32, which is what they had hoped to do. I mean, it got put on the back burner by Bally and then also by um, this new re-release, which is kind of a shame, but at the same time, there are a lot of reasons why it didn't get re-released or released at all. So I won't get into them here, but I'm not surprised. So I'm gonna show you that this covers a whole bunch of games. Some of them are prototypes, like Music Maker. What else we got as prototypes here that never actually were released? Music Maker is one for sure. I think there's a couple more, although I don't see any right off the top of my head here. Yeah, I don't see any, actually, except for that one. So we'll go to the back. The big the big conspicuous one is this. The, the Z-Grass never was released. So if you got that uh, like from a dealer, and this is from a dealer, SFP, in uh, California. And I, I always want to hear back from dealers or anyone who might have bought their equipment at any of these places I talk about here. If you actually bought your Astrocade at a place called SFP, let me know. So this is also from SFP, and these are um, photocopies of upcoming uh, places, uh, upcoming games, uh, Astro Galactic Invasion and Grand Prix Demolition Derby. Now, I thought this game was released by Bally Arcade, or by Bally, but maybe not. I don't have that uh, release date in order, in my head anyway. This is an article um, on the uh, Bally, and this is just part of it, called the Zgrass 32 Computer Keyboard. And it's about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, so five pages. I'm not going to cover them at all because the Zgrass 32 didn't come out. But if you're interested in the propaganda that was coming out from Astrovision, then um, do yourself a favor and read this. It's called the Zgrass 32 Computer Keyboard. If I remember at some point in time, I OCR'd this document and um, you can read it. But I will read the first paragraph just to get your uh, appetite whetted. Um, the Zgrass keyboard plugs into the arcade to give you a full typewriter keyboard and number pad. You also get additional memory with 32K additional RAM and 24K ROM. The additional RAM gives you more space for creating and storing longer programs. The additional 24K ROM 
contains powerful system software that makes this the easiest computer to use. And by that system software, they were talking about the Zgrass language. Now, this is something I, I want to go over in detail here, but if I did, it would take a long time. So what I'm going to just say is Bob Fabris and many others um, attended a sales meeting by AstroVision in March of uh, March 20th and 21st, 1981. And this is before the release of the system. And this is what was covered. And these are Bob Farris's personal notes that he took on this handout, which is pretty damn cool. Uh, so first in the morning at 8 o'clock was breakfast. And then there was an introduction by uh, Ray George and Dan Dawson. And followed by um, the Zgrass 32 computer presentation. And uh, by Tom DeFonte and Jeff Fredrickson. Then there was a question period in lunch and advertising. Uh, Demet... Dynamic uh, Bally sales success by three-way successful... I don't know what the heck that's all about. Huh. Apparently these were subscribers or they were becoming subscribers. Then a coffee break. <laughs> that's awesome. User groups and open discussion. And then, notice the order this is, cocktails and then dinner. Uh, <laughs> so by the time you get to uh, dinner, you are like, oh yeah, this is the best dinner I ever had. All right, the next morning, it doesn't last too long. You have a continental breakfast and critique of, I guess, probably the previous day, and then a meeting. And uh, at that meeting, apparently, there was a show of the games, side-by-side, -side, full-size arcade. Um, yeah, pretty cool. If anyone has any information about um, that you were there, let me know. Let's see if there's anyone on this list. There are some people... Let's see if there's anyone that I recognize that it belongs to the group. The group the, that were here on the back are Bob Wiles. You can probably read this better than me. Jeff Fredrickson, Tom DeFonte, Dick Ainsworth, probably Bog Ogden, Scott Norris, Mike Peace. So if any of you people are watching this video, leave notes about what you remember seeing at this. Then there's a letter, letter from uh, uh, Jim McConnell. And this is from March 5th, 1981, so this predates that. And he's just saying, um, he's given Bob uh, an example of the two new uh, 2000 baud uh, basic cartridges. He says they're 1800 baud, but I think they really ended up being 2000 baud. Not much of a difference there. Um, let's see. He talks to, oh, uh, Bob Fabris wrote notes. He says that he would like an, uh, Z grass on an EEPROM, but I don't believe that ever happened. All right, this is what I was talking about when I was mentioning earlier. There's some stuff I'd like to talk about, like, in full. Like, I would just discuss this letter that was written by um, Brett Bilbray, which, oh, by the way, ding! Brett's name has been mentioned what, once again. I think this is the 15th video, and if not in every video, then pretty much every video, his name comes up somehow or other. Um, I'm going to read the first paragraph of this. I'm not even going to try to cover highlights because there's way too much to cover. But I will, uh, let's see, I don't think there's actually a date on when this was written. Um, see if he says at the end. I mean, it's written in about 1981 because this is, he's talking about before the new uh, Astro Basic comes out. Yeah, but he has comments on it and why it shouldn't be released as is, but it was released as is. Um, yeah, but let's see what he has to say. Um, and like I said, this is Brett Bilbray of Spectre Systems. Uh, this is questionnaire analysis, and uh, keep in mind that Brett was part of the Michigan uh, Valley Users Group. And it says, This analysis is to provide objective and personal reactions of how members of the Michigan Valley Users Group responded to our questionnaire and comments on what we feel are important subjects to be aware of in order to capture the largest possible market for both the Zgrass 32 Ad Under and Valley Arcade game. And he goes on on how it was constructed. Uh, there, and he says... Most users, and then I guess um, it turns out that uh, there were 35 people who answered the questionnaire, which means was the user group was uh, quite large. Most users who answered this questionnaire already owned a Bally Arcade, 80%, uh, so 28 out of the 35. Another 14.3% wanted to get one, and 5.7 are waiting to see what the ad under is like before they decide. I guess they never bought one, so they were maybe lucky. Most of the arcade owners have the basic cartridge and the cassette interface but others are waiting for the ad under, and of course, some are content, content it, with it just as a game. About half of the responses indicated they wanted a keyboard, printer, and memory expansion for the arcade game. A few even uh, wanted to attach a disk drive. Although access to these features would be 
made available with the ad editor, some users have already attached these devices directly to the arcade game. And uh, he goes on in, in a lot, a lot of detail about what um, is covered in the questionnaire. And I mean, this is a really, really interesting read. This is the sort of thing I would love to see covered. I mean, a podcast and a video format doesn't really work for this. I mean, someone needs to go through and comb all this material and write a book or two books about um, the Arcadian and maybe the Valley Arcade in general. Is that person gonna be me? I don't think so, but I'm sure anyone uh, who's interested in uh, this kind of material, one of you will pop up one of these days and write the book. And I'm looking forward to reading it. Send me a free copy, please. I'd love to see it. I'll give you feedback and make suggestions. All right, uh, March 12th, 1981. And this is from, I think, Brett Bilberry again. So, ding. And he says, oh, oh this is the one where he talks about uh, what he finds problematic with the uh, Bally Basic re-release, which is the referred to as After Basic. He says, this short uh, report gives some comments and suggestions for the new Basic cartridge. Um, Overall, my opinion of this cartridge is it's not ready for marketing, um, but it was. It was marketed pretty much as is. They might have fixed one or two things that he pointed out here. It's interesting that he was able to find errors. Um, let's see. He found a couple errors that bombed BASIC, so it made, actually made BASIC crash. So I've never tried these things. I don't know if BASIC will still crash. I should try. That would be interesting. Um, but most of them are just things that were dropped um, out of Bally BASIC. Um, to make room for other features, which uh, he, I don't think he mentions here. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, and right here we have, I don't know what this is. This is a list of people who, yeah, I don't know what this is a list of, but there's a list of people with their addresses. And this is from George Moses uh, from April 17th, 1981. This is in regards to a flyer that came with the re-released Valley Arcade. And um, he says, Here's a proof of your threefold mailer. We have the original here in case you wish to make any changes in the copy. Just let us know. Do you want the original sent to you? And what he's talking about is I'm pretty sure this came with not, maybe not every single Astrocade ever sent out, but most of them. Um, and this was included in the box. So, this, so suddenly after the Astrocade was re-released, or the Ballet Arcade was re-released as the Astrocade, the subscription base to the Arcadian skyrocketed. Um, from so starting in volume three to five or so for so for about two or three years there were um, thousands of more subscribers because they heard about the Arcadian rather than having to seek it out and by writing letters to Bally and if they were lucky they would get a response from Bally that said yeah there's a newsletter there's two of them actually and they would find out that way but otherwise it was difficult to find out about it but this was um, you just fold this in three and you, this is you'd open it up and this is what you'd read about. Oh, this is a newsletter. Here's uh, some screenshots of, of video games I can just type in. There's programs, there's hardware, there's expansions, there's interfaces, reviews, ad space. And it talks about how you can get the entire volume one and two. So there you go. And let's see what we have here. And back then I would have, even if I was 10 years old, which in 1981, I would have been nine years old. I would have said, I need this parents. But 1981, I. Did I even have my 2600? I don't even think I had my 2600 in 1981 yet. So this is the last bit of information in here from the Astrocade management. These are talking about the new features that have been added to Astro Basic. And I'll just go over them briefly. There's an editing feature, a list feature, um, which I don't know how that's different. There already was a list feature. Oh, you can trace. Yeah, there's a trace feature. He calls it a list feature here. Um, Let's see, line command, uh, line command changed. I'm not, I'm not sure what that's talking about. Um, there's a new kind of array, which is much more useful than the original kind of array. It talks about how the screen setup works out. And um, let's see, it talks about how the tape command works a little bit differently. Uh, program read write works a little bit differently. And data read and write, uh, you can do uh, more easily as well. Um, there are workarounds to do pretty much everything here except the 2000 baud format and editing line numbers in Valley Basic, but this makes it exceptional and easy to do in Astro Basic, which if you've used other basics with a full screen interface, you'd be like, whoa, that's not easy. But compared to Valley Basic, where if you had an error with your line, you had to retype it, it's much easier. All right, let's move on to the next folder. 
this folder suddenly got more interesting. Uh, I just spent just a minute or two reading it, and uh, it's called in Inquiries. And um, when I was showing this in my preview last time, this was all opened up, and I didn't realize that what this was. So last time, I'd noticed that these were returns, and I thought they were issues of the Arcadian. Um, but they are not issues of the Arcadian. So these were sent out January 21st, 1981, to people who requested information from the Arcadian. And these two people requested information and then didn't live there anymore, I guess. Um, but this person requested information and it was also returned to Bob. Um, so I'm not sure what the deal was. These people didn't include their correct address. He typed it wrong. I don't know. Um, what's interesting is I... I um, this hasn't really changed too much. Return to the sender stuff from the post office still looks pretty much the same. But okay, so now that I see what this is, if you ask requested for information about the Arcadian, or about the, just the newsletter in general, or about the Astrocade, or about the Blue Ram upgrade, he sent you these four sheets of paper, which is pretty darn cool. Um, he's, he would write, uh, so I'll show you what this is. And it says, to uh, owners of the Bally TV game. Here, da -da -da -da. Trying to separate pages. They're stuck together. So the, what's interesting is, I guess these are photocopies, but they feel like, I don't know, they're, they're on a glossy kind of paper. So I'm not sure how these were copied, but they feel weird. They're very, they don't look shiny, but they feel as if they should be shiny. Anyway, to owners of the Bally TV game, are you aware of the computing power of your machine? Then he lists some games that were printed. Um, gives some things that you can learn from the Arcadian. Uh, and he talks here about uh, the undersigned is publishing a newsletter. And this is something he sent out much earlier, I think in 1980, I was going to say 87, but 1978 or 79, uh, probably 78, about how, how there was going to be a newsletter. Um, oh, actually, this is an updated version of that. Yeah, I didn't read this fully, but because, yeah, this is already talking about the Blue Ram and stuff like that. Um, so if you're interested in what was in here, you can all read this. It's all scanned and online. Um, and he provided an example of uh, some short programs. I'm not sure what these do. I haven't looked at them closely at all. But these are one, two, three, four, five programs that do something in BASIC. Let's see if he says what they do. I don't think he does. Um, he says, the following program samples were picked from more than 75 that have so far appeared in the Arcadian. They are short enough to enter in just a few minutes, yet good enough to give you an idea of what's possible. Which is interesting, right? Um, most programs are from one to two pages long and contains some clever items and effects. Uh, we can play Wumpus, uh, Othello, and Checkers against the computer, or use the Bally as a chessboard only to keep track of the moves, or play Artillery Duel, Horse Race, Mastermind against each other. And that's only a short list of games. So yeah, that is that. And finally, here's the uh, topping that, on this cake here. Um, it's arrived. A star is born. So yeah, uh, this is a, an example of the 4K Blue Ram. So this attaches to your 50k RAM expansion, and it says, and this is before the Blue RAM uh, was available, Blue RAM Basic. So at the time, what you could get with it was extended strings, machine language programming for up to 4k games, modify and save game cassettes on tape, which is basically like if you made this exact same thing for the Nintendo now, they would sue you right out the door because one of the things they were talking about doing is save your games to tape and you can save them and modify them. And people did. People did save like the cartridges to tape and then load them again and use them as cartridges. Um, you could also uh, hook up printers and keyboards and stuff like that. And this is what I think is interesting. I didn't realize what this was last time either. So this is from a company called Video Play. And Ellen Parker, I don't know if they, they must have sold the Arcadian and he says, um, enclosed are triplicate copies of sales leads, the names and addresses of our readers who want more information about your products. The names are on mailing labels for your convenience. So Video Play Magazine, which I'm not familiar with, covering the world of home video, they must have had an ad or something in there, or maybe back in those days you would have an index card in the back where you could circle, like if you were interested in a certain ad, and then they would send this off. You'd pay a certain amount of money to this, to this magazine, and you'd get these sales leads. And so that's why, where these sales leads came from. And so all these are printouts uh, that could be stuck. They're, um, I guess you just wet them, and then they'd be uh, sent off. So Video Play sent these to, in December 1980. Um, I guess these are all 
in triplicates. Yeah, so on in December 1980, these were sent to Bob. So that's pretty neat, right? Um, we've got, I think, two more folders to cover, and I think uh, we'll wrap it up after that, uh, after giving a preview of what's coming up. This folder is unusual. It didn't have any um, label. I labeled it as letter order, uh, box one, folder 51. And there's lots of comments on this one from Bob Fabris. And this is from Clyde Perkins. And it's from uh, February 3rd, 1982. And he lived in uh, Michigan. And he says, uh, Dear Bob, I hope you're arrested up from the show in Vegas. I guess he's talking about the CES from 1982. Guess you had a good time anyway. John did. He was quite taken with the ad under. I hope that they get it to market this time. The enclosed memory jogger may help resolve a mystery. Enclose my books. And he talks about something that's not really consequential here. I'm getting some inquiries and a few orders for Blue Rams again, so we're back in production. I'm suggesting only the Blue Ram keyboard, modem, and printer interface, and the Blue Ram extended basic cartridge. And he says, I wish that you had four or five feet of snow, which he puts in bold. We have some 10 foot drifts. This is a great year for skiers and other nuts. And that's it. This is what I think is weird. So this was sent by someone named Irv Collin in um, about uh, early 1981, I think. Oh, October 1981. So Irvin Callen says, here's an order for $853.65. Keep in mind, for that amount of money, he could have gone out in 1981 and bought a lot of different computers. But he wanted to spend his money on the Astrocade, and he did, or tried to anyway. Some of it he couldn't actually order, or maybe he did, because some of the, all these... Most of these things came out, but I don't know if you could order it all from Bob. Maybe he passed on uh, the money to other vendors. I don't know. Um, so he was missing a page, so we wanted that. A bell check unit a page. Uh, he ordered the um, Viper 5 system uh, for $400, and it's not released yet, so he returned to $400. An XY tutorial, uh, he wanted that. He wanted some other guides. Um, the source book. He wanted the ballet check, which he paid $69 for, and he wasn't sure how much shipping and handling would be, so he included an extra $100. Like, yeah, interesting. But what he, I find neat is what he did for a living and what he was hoping to be able to do, which is now common. You can do this very easily. Um, and he says, I am a photo finisher by trade, and I am primarily interested in generating graphics. One project I have been asked to work on is to scan a color negative via a color television camera and display the image right way round, that is, produce a positive image on the CRT, just like a color photograph. Also, if I can be of any assistance to you or the Arcadian in the area of photo finishing, please do not hesitate to call me. So that's a pretty neat thing. Now you can easily, I mean, I, like years ago, I scanned in, I guess 15 years ago, I scanned in hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, negatives and uh, scanned them in at uh, 300 Maybe 1200 DPI, something like that. Very high resolution. All right, uh, one more folder to go. This will be the last folder that I cover in this video, and it's unlabeled. We'll start going through it. Uh, this is a newsletter from March 1981. I'm not sure, I guess it's from Chicago. Maybe someone sent it along to Bob uh, in California, I'm not sure. But it, it, it uh, has one uh, article on the Ballet Professional Arcade. It's re-release. And it just seems like uh, maybe this was printed in here directly from a flyer or something like that. I'm not sure how that worked. Um, so I'm not really going to cover it too much. But uh, yeah, there was pe there were people who were interested in covering the Astrocade. Um, and they put it in newsletters and stuff. There was, there was a little bit of buzz on it upon its re-release. Uh, I do find this uh, newsletter more interesting because it was really aimed at people who were buying beta tapes and VHS tapes, and um, they I really have this weird curiosity to look up some of these games, cause, or not games, movies. So released in March of 1981 on tape were Barefoot in the Park, Black Marble, Caddyshack, Cruisin', Magnum Force, They Don't Shoot Horses, Don't They Shoot Horses, Don't They, and 9 to 5. And I wonder how much they cost. I, I seem to recall back then, if you bought a movie, they cost around $79 in about 1981. Um, but I, that was before they were trying to show that people should collect movies. They were just selling them, I think, primarily to people who 
were wealthy. I don't know what the deal was. Then there's an article on the video disc system, and they're talking about the RCA video disc system, which is the select division, which didn't catch on too much. Okay, if we continue, um, there's more stuff in here, but there's not too much worthwhile. Nothing about the Astrocade anyway, I don't think. But I, I do think it's neat that there's classifieds. People probably played for those. Um, then there's one page from Byte Magazine, and in the back of Byte Magazine, you could uh, advertise your newsletter. And I don't know if it's cost money, it probably did. But on page 180, this just gives you an example of how much larger the Byte Magazine was in the Arcadian, which was usually 10 pages. And that's five pages front and back. So April 1981, 1980, and I think it's in other issues too. Um, there's the Arcadian newsletter, and this is how you'd contact them, and this is what it was about. Um, I covered this in the last episode, the flyer, the cut and paste version, and this is actually what you'd get in the mail. So if you were mailed this, this would have been folded into thirds, and you would open it up to reveal this, uh, what you get with the, what you would get if you were an arcade uh, Arcadian subscriber. And since I've covered this in an episode, if you want to know more about it, you can go back to episode 14 and read it, or watch it. And this is the dealer. Uh, a kit, and I'll, I'll do a zoom in here, and it's, I think it's 11 by, or, eight and a, or probably 9 inches by 12 inches. It's large enough to f to hold an 8.5 inch page by 11.5 uh, inch page, or 11 inch page, um, and a poster as well, and maybe some other items. I don't know what else was in here, but the only other item that was in this one was a poster, um, besides this catalog. And if I'm paying attention, I will have overlaid a picture of, just briefly, of the poster um, from my collection that when I took a picture of it, because I think I know where the folder or the poster is right now, but I can't find it. I mean, I could find it if I really dug through my collection, but I'm not going to bother. So this is Astrocade's uh, uh, first catalog. I'm going to pause here for just a moment and show you a little bit uh, clearer what is in there. I'm going to try a little experiment here. I'm sitting down now rather than standing up, which is how I always do this. I think this is the first time I've sat down while I've made part of the video, not any of these videos, unless I'm playing a game. But this is the first catalog that was released by Astrovision, and at the time it's still called the Bally Professional Arcade, and this catalog is from July of 1981, um, and it's called the More Games, More Fun, More to Come catalog, and it advertises, I think, 20 or 21 cartridges, and all of these were released, or re-released, um, some of them, I think, were first released through Astrovision, and um, one of them was not released. But we'll get to all of them real quick. And we have where Astrovision is really, uh, from Columbus, Ohio. And I've heard of people finding um, in that area um, prototypes, and also in Chicago. Uh, but we have Astro Battle, which is originally not just in the arcade, but also for the Bally Arcade. It was called Space Invaders. Um, that's part of the action skill series. Um, and the way I'm uh, situated, I might actually bump my camera. So if I do, forgive me, forgive me. Uh, Star Battle, a game that I think originally came out in like 79. So it's already two years. Most of these games were, um, like this one was already released by Bally. This one wasn't. This is um, Galaxian. Um, and I think there was originally, if Bally had released this, it would have been called Galaxian. But they didn't. And for some reason, I don't know why, um, there is no, uh, there was no, they couldn't use the names of the arcade games, they didn't get those rights. But of course, the, uh, Valley didn't have the rights to create Star Wars games either, and this is obviously a blatant ripoff of uh, Star Wars. There's a, uh, something that looks eerily similar to an X-Wing fighter, and something that looks uh, similar to, but obviously isn't the same as, a TIE fighter. Uh, so Galactic Invasion, if you ever get a chance to play this one, it's uh, really great, um, and try it on a higher skill level, and you'll die within moments because the alien and the movement is so fast, um, which I just like to see that in general. Um, Space Fortress. Um, I don't think this was released uh, by Valley either. This is one of the better games on the Astrocade. Dog Patch, which some people... I mean, it got terrible reviews in the newsletter, if I recall, especially in the Cursor newsletter, where they said it was kind of junky and for kids, and I find it's it's a two-player only game. It's also a game that inspired me to start disassembling and understanding how the Ballet Arcade worked, um, because it's only 2K, 
It's very simple. I mean, I can understand why people picked on it because it is so simple. But um, I could show a little close up here what the game looks like, but that's basically all the graphics. But this was an arcade game from like 78 or so. And uh, so I, uh, I decided to use this one as an example to learn how to uh, program the Astrocade, which I did learn about uh, how to do it. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I did do a whole bunch of disassembling work and uh, so Richard Degler finished it up. So this is probably the most thoroughly documented game on the Astrocade that's been disassembled. There are some that we have the original source code for, but this one here has been completely disassembled uh, by both myself and Richard Degler. So if you want to know how the Astrocade works, uh, look at the source code for this because it's been heavily commented, partially by me, but mostly by Richard Degler. And you can see the graphics, all that good stuff. Then we have 280 Zap and Dodge em, which looks okay. Um, it's like Night Driver, but this was originally called uh, Dots and 280 Zap in the arcade. Let's see if I can't center this again. Uh, but this game is too easy. I mean, I can play this on the fastest speed without crashing pretty much every time, so they needed to change the difficulty. Uh, Pirate's Chase, which I don't believe was released by Bally, so this is the first time it's released here. Grand Prix Demolition Derby. Uh, Seawolf Missile, which was one of the early releases. And I don't think they should have re-released it, but then again, they had such a small library, they kind of had to. Um, I w started to disassemble this one, because this is also, I think, a 2K game. But it's it's just, I gave up. Not because it was difficult to understand, but because it's just not it's not a game worth playing. And there's Flickr, and this, most games don't flicker on the Astrocade. Um, and it's just, it's an early example of what they were trying to put out quickly uh, in the early days of the Astrocade. Uh, Red Baron Panzer Attack. This is, of course, the combat clone. Um, this is Brickyard Clowns, which is the breakout clone. Tornado Baseball, Tennis. So these are the Pong games. Well, three of these are Pong games. One's the, a baseball game, which is very simple. And I've never actually played because it requires two players. In fact, all these require two players, but I've played all of them except the tennis, or except the baseball game. Biorhythm, which if you've been following along in this video series, this was used as a method to sell the Astrocade and it actually worked. Go back into one of my earlier videos, it's maybe 12, 13, or 14, I'm forgetting. These are all beginning to run together. But here we can see that Jane Doe and John Doe seem to be compatible with each other on certain days. <laughs> and let's see, what are we getting up to? Uh, Music Maker, this is a prototype. You can find it um, in the prototype section. It originally had a built-in 300 or 200 baud interface, and there were some prototypes sold through Mike White that did have that. can't remember how many he sold, 30 or something like that in the 1980s. Or that I think there were 30... 30-something made, and he took them, because I still bought one in 2001 from him, and that was 20 years ago. Let's see. Uh, football, which is a highly regarded football game for the system, and many people consider it one of the better football games. I'm not a football fan, so I wouldn't know. Uh, Valley Pin, which is a pretty neat football game. Another game I started to disassemble, um, and that was fun. I might continue disassembling that one someday. Uh, Amazing Maze Tic-Tac-Toe. This one has been fully disassembled by Richard Degler. Uh, rest in peace, Richard. Let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, Blackjack, uh, uh, Poker, and AC Ducey. And this is all card games. And then we have the obligatory um, game for kids uh, so they can have an educational title called Speed Math Bingo. And by the way, one of the first cartridges, one of the first pieces of software I ever had for my Commodore 64 in 1983 or 84 when I got my system was Speed Math Bingo Math. It was actually called Speed Math Bingo on the Commodore 64 and did I play it? Yeah, yes I did because it was one of my only cartridges and that's the back. So yeah, if you look at this online you don't get the idea that of course it's a catalog. It looks like individual pages but it's a catalog. All right, let's see what's coming up in the uh, next episode. Technically, if you go by the rules here, I just have one folder left. That's it. Well, this is going to take more than one video to cover. This is some of the more interesting material. All the interesting, all the interesting material in the box has been covered. And this is even more interesting to me and probably to many viewers here. So this is all in one folder, but it's, I mean, this is thicker than even probably everything that I covered in the last two videos. So that's 10 folders combined. So I'm guessing what I will do is I will dedicate the next two to three videos 
to covering this much material. Maybe not, we'll see. Um, but I, this one is labeled an Astrovision Incorporated, um, and I'm only gonna, I don't want to cover all of this, but I will give a sneak peek, like I always do at the end of my video, of what's in some of this. And I might cover actually more than what I covered today, which is unusual, because I've actually sometimes said I'll cover less. But uh, in this case, I will uh, take a look at what's in here. And um, this is an example of stuff that's, well, everything I've shown in, this, in these videos so far, most of it anyway, has been an example of what you can see as part of the Bob Fabris collection that just isn't available elsewhere, really. I mean, it's available now because I've scanned it, but you don't really get to have a hands-on touch like you get in this video where you can see I pull out a folder, I open it up, stuff like that. All right, let's take a look at this quickly, and I'm going to try to cover everything in here very briefly, and then I will uh, close out. No, no, this isn't a mistake. I just happened to take out the folder, dink, and I took a look at this and I said, hey, this is the first time I've seen this uh, box empty in a decade since I started uh, or finished scanning this box, probably. Well, this is an empty box and I'm going to show what will be coming up in the next video or two, maybe even three, depending on how slowly I go through it. So let's get down to that. But look at this. Look at all this empty space in here. Hello, 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 hello. I try to keep these preview sections at the end of each video very short, maybe five minutes long, six minutes at the most. This one, I'm going to have to breeze through everything in here uh, in order to cover it, so this is going to take at least two videos. But we're going to open this ugly orange folder, which is just one folder, but it's thick. And what do we have? We have three folders from Astrovision. I, I think they each contain different stuff. So this would have been something I think you would maybe pick up at the CES, something like that. And there's uh, like, this would have been a promotional item, so you, you know, they would have sent this, or you would have picked this up and then maybe used this to put in your magazine or something like that uh, to help promote it. That was the idea. There's lots and lots of material in here. Lots of it. I'm not going to show it all because there's just too much. But I will show it in the next one. In the next video. Uh, here's another folder, and this has some different content. In fact, maybe it's all different. Yeah, this is actually probably not from the, uh, from Astrocade. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe they sent this out to Bob so he could help promote it. But this is uh, some stuff that was torn out of magazines from the time period. So this is from Video Games Magazine. This is from Electronic Games. Um, when they, and, and there were magazines from the time period that did cover the Astrocade. Um, so these are flyers for the Astrocade. Let's see. Here's a game called Cavern Quest, which I actually typed in. And it's been archived due to me typing it in. Um, photocopy of it, something. We've got just, I mean, just all tons of stuff that were torn out of magazines. This looks like it was, I don't even know where some of the sources of this are, but this has all been scanned, I believe, and maybe sometimes not the back of everything, but if the, the side that's about the Astrocade would have been scanned in. Oh, Game Line, this is something that came out, turned in, um, oh, here, here it is right here. So, this would have been the uh, modem for the Atari 2600, and it did come out. It did come out. Turned into America Online. Uh, here's the ColecoVision Atom. So this might be, this actually looks like, now that I'm looking at it, uh, stuff that maybe was picked up at the CES. This is the Spectra video this was released. This is, um, yeah, this is, I guess I must have covered this earlier because I remember going over this briefly. Maybe when I was covering everything that was in this box, yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'll cover it again briefly. I'll just flip through it. I'm not even going to talk unless something catches my eye. Um, I'm trying to get through this in just a few pages here. I do like this one. This is about video art, but I will cover it in, you know, when I get to it. Um, what is this thing? I'll go over to the next one. All right, so that's basically just many, many, many more torn out stuff out of... Uh, yeah, this is going to... This Just this itself will co probably cover at least a video. All right, let's get into the next one. Oh, more stuff. Um, some ads. This would have probably be, been from the sales meeting agenda from 1982. Wow. <clears throat> this was this page actually was used in a lot of um, issue, a lot of magazines pr that were promoting the Z-Grass. Now I don't know if this is a dummy or what, but yeah. 
neat. So, like, if you ever see a picture of him, like, in a magazine of the Zgrass 32, it's it's this one. And this was handed out at probably the CES. So there's that. I'm going through these fast, fast, fast. Nitron, uh, they are the company that manufactured starting in, what, 81 or, yeah, um, the, the um, silicon chips that were the custom chips that made up the Astrocade, the three of them, the address chip, the I.O. chip, and the data chip. Here's another ad from 1982 for them. They eventually went out of business in 84 because they were, had uh, so many uh, orders with Astrovision and were depending on those sales. Now, this is something I've uh, scanned in. This is from a magazine called Games, which normally didn't um, promote the uh, video games, but it did in this issue, and I scanned this in high quality, and you can download this. So take a look at this. I'll look up private screenings um, on um, archive.org, and you can download this and look at it. It's a great little read. Uh, and then there's some more material, lots and lots of material here. I don't know what any of this is. Lots of this is all upside down for some reason. Oh, ABC Hobbycraft newsletters. Um, look at this, poor. Look at this, already starting the beginning of the end. Bankruptcy court, um, 1983 for Astrocade. So it didn't last long. It didn't last long. Um, but, you know, the Arcadian went on with a user base with the Arcadian all the way till 1986. So that's pretty incredible. Here's an ad. Um, some more torn out pages from many magazines, just so much stuff. And yeah, this is gonna, I'm gonna estimate this is gonna take three issues to, oh, here's something neat. Um, I looked around for this for a long time. This is the November 1982 issue of Consumers Reports. The magazine still exists today. It took me years and years to find this newsletter or this magazine. And I finally found an issue for about, I don't know, five or six bucks on eBay, uh, maybe a year or two ago. So maybe 2019. And I bought it and uh, I scanned in, although I don't think I put on line anywhere, but I did scan in um, this article. And the reason it's my, one of my favorites is because in the November 1982 issue of, they, they declared that the best video game system on the market is the Ballet Arcade. <laughs> Pretty incredible. Uh, what else we got going here? And that, soon thereafter, I mean, Ballet went out of business. Comb, so you could buy the Astrocade for $98 with three games. Yeah, it's just so, so, so sad. The ending came so quickly for the system. Um, and I, I don't know if that was avoidable or not. I, I can't really speculate. But, yeah, that's about, that's about it. Go to the other side here, maybe show the very last of it. Um, you know, here, here was the world that was up and coming. The computer world, um, you know, with the great American video game crash of 1982, 1983. Um, the world and gamers moved along to either computers or um, continued to play their consoles just like they always did. But uh, consumers didn't really notice that there was a crash of the industry and that there was a quote shakeout or whatever we, we call it now. Um, I certainly didn't. And I think many people from that era didn't either, except unless you were in the industry. And overseas, that didn't happen. It just happened in the United States, as far as I'm aware. In fact, some countries got the benefit of that, like Mexico and South America got a lot of the exported stuff sent to them from America. And this is the last stuff. So did I ever, did I get to this in about five minutes? I got to it in about five or six minutes. So yeah, there we are. Look at these joysticks. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Like I said, this is going to take quite a bit of time to get through. I'm going to say, I want to get through it in two, but it's going to take three probably to get through this one, this one folder, supposedly. And when I do, then I will um, take a break and I'm going to cover my Atari 600 XL, like I think I mentioned in the last episode. Uh, so thanks for watching. Come back for more. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode.